Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John Hook. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday. I want you to stick around if you can over the next half hour because we're going to talk about something that, uh, frankly, very few people even knew existed. A practice in cities in the Valley called release time. Now, what this means in plain language is top union officials basically get a city job. They don't even have an office at the city. They get paid full salary and benefits to do nothing but union work. The Goldwater Institute, they completely exposed this recently. They filed suit against the city of Phoenix. They filed suit against the police labor organization, PLEA. And uh, we ran a story about it this week explaining what this is. And we're going to talk to the two principals involved from the Goldwater Institute in a moment. But first, release time, union pay, you're getting the shaft. Here it is. The city of Phoenix has 15,000 employees, from the people who pick up your trash, to policemen, to firemen, to city staff. All city workers are represented by seven labor unions. But did you know the top leaders of those unions, a total of 27 people, are paid yearly salaries by the city to do nothing but union work? Their only duties are to do union work, not city work. That costs the taxpayers roughly $3.7 million a year. It adds up to about 73,000 hours a year. Mark Flatten of the Goldwater Institute blew the lid on what's called release time, paying union leaders full city salaries to exclusively conduct union business. There's really only one winner, and that's the unions. The taxpayers are footing the bill. I would dispute that we get nothing out of the union relationship. Assistant City Manager Ed Zerker downplays the cost to taxpayers. 3.7 million is about a one quarter of 1% of our entire payroll. That money should go back to the taxpayers, or that money should go to uh, keep open libraries and parks. There are any number of things you can use uh, uh, 3.7 million dollars for, but simply paying the salary and benefits of top union officials is certainly a policy decision that they're going to have to address in these upcoming contract negotiations. So how did release time become standard in union contracts? It was first negotiated in back in the 1970s and it's been there ever since. City Councilman Sal DeCicio is an outspoken critic of paying release time to top union officials, yet he voted for it last year. Even the language that are used in these contracts, they're designed so that the common guy on the street can't understand them. Are you being purposely kept in the dark about matters like this? I believe that we were. Is it not your guy's job to make it as simple as you can so those guys can represent us. Yes, it is our job to do that, you're right. And Fair. we understand on our side as management an, a renewed obligation to be very explicit and clear and take as much time as necessary to explain every aspect of that we can to them. When it comes to paying release time to top union officials, the city of Phoenix is not unique. Most major valley cities pay it. Mesa, Chandler, Glendale. The notable exception is Scottsdale. Why are the taxpayers involved in this at all? Scottsdale Mayor Jim Lane was once a union member back in New Jersey. But he thinks taxpayers yeah. should not be paying top union bosses to do union business on city time. I can't explain that at all. In fact, I can't understand how it could even be justified. Why is Scottsdale different from Phoenix and the other Valley cities? Scottsdale does not have collective bargaining agreements with the unions, meaning union power and influence is limited. We do have union members, certainly, and of course they have their representation, but there isn't an official collective bargaining agreement and there is no official capacity that they hold in the city. Councilman DeCicio says if the unions want release time, then the unions should pay for it. If the unions want to be able to pay their members and individuals to do union activity, it should come out of their dues. It shouldn't come out of the pocket of the taxpayer. And that final point, it shouldn't come out of the pocket of the taxpayers, is exactly why the Goldwater Institute is filing suit. And the guy who's going to uh, fight it for the Goldwater Institute is Clint Bullock. He's the attorney for the Goldwater Institute. Mark Flatten on the right of your screen is the investigative reporter who, as I put, blew the lid on this. And we should point out, uh, there was an omission in there. Tempe does this too. Yes. I, I talked about Glendale, Mesa, Chandler. 
Tempe does it as well. Pretty much every city except Scottsdale. Mark, when you went in and found this, uh, Sal DeCicio saying when he looked over the contract and that he read it, and even Zerker pulled out the contract for me, said the labor contract's 400 pages. It, it seems that the council just doesn't know what's in the contract, that it's written in such a way that it's hard to decipher what they're voting on. Now that they know, they don't like it, many of them. In a sense, it's hard to decipher because when you read the contracts, it's, it's, it's written in, in, in language that, it, that Clint would probably recognize right offhand. But to a layman, it, it doesn't strike you as they're, they're paying these people to do nothing but work for the union. The other factor, I gotta I got confess, when I first got into this, is even when you read the language, you think, I, that can't be right. I can't be reading this right because that just makes no sense. <laughs> and, and honestly, the first few interviews I did with, with uh, folks at the city and folks at the union, my first question to them was, am I reading this right? And they all said, yeah, you're reading it right. So what was the defense for having it in there? Well, part of, part of the problem, I think, with these union contracts is that they don't appear to actually start from scratch. These are, these are two-year contracts, and, and, and it appears that basically every two years they'll say, okay, we're going to take the old contract and we'll add a couple provisions to it. Nobody's actually gone back and looked at what's already in them. What, uh, in fact, there are some of these union contracts where the typeface is actually different for, for new provisions. And these go back to the 1970s? I believe the they go back Phoenix. all the way to the mid-70s, 1975, 76. Clint, what do you, what's the basic contention in the lawsuit? What are you saying? Our Constitution contains a really wonderful provision called the Gift Clause, and it forbids government in Arizona, local and state, from giving gifts to private entities or individuals by subsidy or otherwise. This was the provision that we used to challenge the City North subsidy, and that ended corporate subsidies here in Arizona. Now we're turning it to the practice of union release time. Let's take a look at tape number three, City North, and how this dovetails into what you're doing here at Goldwater. And it is interesting. I mean, this project, this, this essentially you felt, Goldwater felt, was a giveaway where the taxpayer did not get equal value in return. That's right. It was a $97.3 million, uh, million dollar subsidy to a Chicago developer to build a grandiose shopping mall that has turned out to be a white elephant. Let me ask you, and this, this almost gets into the Fife Symington defense. Um, Somebody could look at City North and say, down the line, that will eventually be a thriving business. For so gosh. is it fair to undercut <laughs> it before it gets going? Well, undercutting it is one thing. Subsidizing it is another. There's a, an adage that retail follows rooftops. You should not have to bribe somebody to, pay, to, to sell you things. And likewise, as Mark has pointed out in the union release time, context if the union wants uh, to release its workers to to do union activities they had to put them on the union payroll these are police officers who are being taken off the streets to do union work so not only are we paying them money but we're making ourselves less safe getting back to this point of release time that it, you you're essentially taking six officers off the street to Full do time. nothing but union work that's right and then thousands of additional hours that the union can dole out as it sees fit and every hour is an hour away from police work mark how, how do you how do you go about your business without it appearing and we ran into this when we ran the story that you're just simply bashing the union I guess the union has a place at the table but is it at a point where where I guess the sense is it's being abused the issue is not an anti-union issue or a pro-union issue the issue is is this an appropriate use of taxpayer money? It's not the union's responsibility to say, no, 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 we don't want release time. It's the city council's responsibility. That's why we elect them. Uh, you know, in, in any negotiation, there needs to be a dynamic. The union, appropriately, is going to push for all it can get. But what you need to have on the other side of the table is a city council that's willing to say, no, that's not appropriate. That's, that's not fair to the taxpayers. And given the, the political influence of the unions, the, the fact that public employees have a very powerful voice in elections, it becomes very difficult for individual council members uh, to say no to the labor organizations. Okay, and that, and that gets into a really interesting discussion because there, there's this sense at City Hall, particularly among Sal to CCL, I think Thelda Williams is starting to kind of get on board with this, 
that city staff in some ways is keeping these guys in the dark about some of this stuff. What's in it for city staff to make it really nice for the unions? Do you, Clint, you want to handle it's that? It's a kumbaya atmosphere. Basically, it makes their jobs easier not to have to negotiate hard. And Mark is absolutely right. These people are our trustees. They are public servants. They are uh, the people who are supposed to be keeping watch over our taxpayer money. And it's a lot easier for them to just go along to get along. And if the unions want release time, so much the better. And I asked Ed Zerker, this uh, assistant city manager of Phoenix, and he his response to me was, remember, we're taxpayers too. We don't want to just give away the, the store here. Well, then they shouldn't be. <laughs> and when that happens, uh, and, and Mark said, you know, someone like Clint, a lawyer, uh, might might recognize this language. Even when I knew what to look for, I couldn't find this language in the contract because there's no title saying union release time or anything like that. It is literally buried, it is buried. in the contract. Okay. It, even beyond the, the easily understood provisions, there are also other provisions in these contracts <laughs> that are just not quantifiable. Uh, for instance, some of the union contracts allow union stewards uh, to take off a full day of training on the union contract. Another part of the, that same contract will say you can have up to 55 union stewards, and another part will say you can have 25 uh, chief stewards. So interspersed at various points in these contracts are little pieces of a puzzle that when you put them all together add up to hundreds of hours of additional release time. So this is the result of just negotiating in another couple of days every two years when they, and before long you've got a bunch of days unaccounted You've, for. I, I think the way they approach these is, is the individual provisions. It becomes easy for the staff and the unions to agree, uh, okay, let's close these negotiations out with an additional uh, release position. In fact, one of the, one, the, head, the president of one of the unions, I asked him, why do you have uh, this uh, uh, full-time release, and he said, I don't know, the city insisted we take it. <laughs> <laughs> because the other unions were wow. getting it. Uh, and this is a debate, folks, that is going on across the country. It's, in fact, a hot button for the election next year. We're going to talk more about it with Clint Bullock. He is the attorney for Goldwater Institute, Mark Flatten, the investigative reporter who's done great work and blown the lid on a lot of this stuff. Back in a minute on Newsmaker Sunday. Welcome back to Newsmaker Sunday. You've heard that about the Goldwater Institute. They they went after the Phoenix Coyotes and the deal on the stadium. Uh, they went after City North, saying it was a giveaway by the City of Phoenix. And now uh, they are after union, well, City Pay to top union leaders. Something called release time, and um, this is 3.7 million dollars that go to these top union officials to do nothing but union work. Mark Flatten and Clint Bullock are our guests on Newsmaker Sunday. Mark's on the right, the investigative reporter who blew this open, and Clint is on the left. He is a lawyer who will litigate this for the Goldwater Institute. Do you believe, Clint, there will be actually a day in court where, where you will fight this issue? I do think so. Uh, the city council is going to consider whether to defend the lawsuit. So uh, taxpayers out there who are interested in this issue, they have the opportunity to influence the city to simply say, we're not going to spend good taxpayer money to defend uh, something that is indefensible. But at some point, either the union or uh, another city will defend this, and perhaps Phoenix will uh, give in to union pressure. This and is going it on as well. all over the country, right? Yes, it goes on in the federal government. It goes in, on in states all over the country, and of course, in virtually every city here in Arizona. If I'm a taxpayer, Mark, in Phoenix, Tempe, Mesa, Chandler, Glendale, why should I care about? the city paying release time to top union officials? You should care because one, it's, it's your tax money. Two, uh, particularly in these tough economic times, that's a lot of money that what are we getting for, what are we getting for our money here? Uh, Councilman DeCicio made the point, you know, we've been closing parks, we've been closing libraries, and here we are paying $3.7 million a year for no other reason than to keep union officials in their union jobs. Uh, you've got to have, a, particularly in lean times, you've got to be careful with, with your money and you've got to make trade-offs, you've got to make choices. There are a lot of things that 
that benefit the community. A lot of investments that governments make that benefit the community. This, this one, even, even the union officials I talked to have had a hard time explaining to me or to anybody how this actually benefits the community. And, and let, me, let me show a little of this interchange with, uh, and I love him, and I know you do too, Jimmy, Jimmy T, Jimmy Tierney. He's the head of the local AFSCME. After the story ran uh, that we ran this week on this release time issue, I asked Jimmy T about it. We won't show all of it, but I want to play some of it and how he defended it. Take a look. You guys, the 23 of you, top union leaders, get 3.7 million bucks a year to do this work. But I still am not quite sure what the work is. What do you guys do? We represent employees that have issues. We, re we bring fairness to the table. Um, I kind of take offense to the fact they call it union work. What I do and the people that are released with me, we have three release positions, myself, a heavy equipment mechanic, an electrician, and a computer guy. And what we do is we make sure that employees have a fair shake at the table. Yeah, but do you need, do you need city money to pay for that? Why not, as Sal DeCicio recommended, pay it out of your own dues. Don't ask the taxpayer to do it. This is something that, uh, as you said, it's been um, uh, in the collective bargaining agreements for four decades a line longer. Uh, when I hired in the city 24 years ago, it was there. Uh, Does that make it right just because it's in the contract? And apparently our own city council members don't know what they're voting on because they voted for it. And when they found out it was in there, they're like, wait a minute, I didn't even know about this. Well, you know, that's one city council person, and, you know, if, if he well, is... Well, it was Stelda Williams also, so to be fair, it's two. Ah, uh, it's two. Well, I would say that they really need to read these contracts, because these contracts aren't very long. They're uh, actually pretty short. If I understand them, and I'm a mechanic, and I'm a, uh, an average citizen, if I can understand it, anybody can understand it. I don't understand Mr. DeCicio's claim that it's... Uh, only for Jimmy, lawyers and he doesn't understand what do we get well, again what do we get out of this is it is it that it improves having you guys around improves the workings of the city is that your contention oh absolutely you know i mean we gave up we meaning all city employees gave up the right to strike or the right to walk out on the job we've given up uh, things that our other unions back east have and it's a give and take system if you give something to me you know it's that's self-explanatory but you know it looks like <laughs> Jimmy T, he, he tried his level best to try to defend it, but I, I still don't get it. I don't understand why we've got to pay. You would think union dues would pay these guys to do their job. Why are the taxpayers paying these guys on top of that? I, I'm baffled. I, I honestly can't think of a justification for this. Even if it was legitimate for the city to pay for union employees to defend their workers, that ought to be specified in the contract. But the unions can use these hours for anything <laughs> and specifically for lobbying, right. which is outrageous. So they're lobbying against the taxpayer, yes. in, in essence. Mark, have you had union rank and file seek you out after I, this I and have. saying, wait a minute, because if they're getting this, if they're getting release time, the top union guys, 3.7 million, if that's part of the overall pot of money that the union negotiates, mm -hmm. that means the rank and file, pardon the expression, is getting screwed. Actually, actually if you buy the official explanation, which is uh, from, from, uh, from the city, which is we have our bottom line number, and if the unions want to use some of that money for release time, no, no, no skin off right. our nose. If you buy that explanation, which has got a lot of holes in it, then basically what that is saying is that's money that should be going to the rank and file members. That's money that could be going to the police officer on the street or hiring a new police officer. That's money that could be going into the pockets of these folks who could then pay union dues to support the unions uh, with that money. But instead, in these contract negotiations, the unions and the city are negotiating money off the table. Who wants to handle this one? Uh, there's no collective bargaining in Scottsdale. And I asked Ed Zerker about this. I said, has anybody brought up the possibility that maybe 
we don't have these collective bargaining agreements anymore. Well, could Phoenix revisit this? Is this just impossible? Absolutely, and the state as a whole could revisit it. We don't think that collective bargaining in the public sector is FDR a good idea. FDR didn't think it was a good That's idea. That's absolutely right. This is one area where we agree with Franklin FDR Delano did Roosevelt. not like collective bargaining in the public arena. And the reason is that these are public servants. These are people who should have undivided loyalty to the people that they serve. The, the legislature actually a couple years ago uh, prohibited this sort of practice for school uh, teachers uh, and, and said they could not be paid by the district for, uh, for union association activities. And they don't do it at the state level. And they do not do it at the state level. The, the, the caveat, I guess, is when you talk to city officials, I asked them, do you make them account for the time? Do you make them account for the money? Is there any accountability in these contracts at all? And the answer you get from them is, no, we can't do that because they might construe that as an unfair labor practice, <laughs> which tells you that they're intimidated by, by the associations, these seven unions that they're doing business with. Back in a moment with Clint Bullock and Mark Fladden, who blew the lid on uh, release time for top union officials. Back in a minute on Newsmaker Sunday. Back on Newsmaker Sunday, as we're talking about uh, this relationship between cities and the unions that represent many workers, Scottsdale being the notable exception, Scottsdale doesn't have collective bargaining for its workers, so the union's um, influence is very limited. But in the other big cities, Tempe, Mesa, Chandler, Glendale, Phoenix, Union, union power is pretty strong here, is it not? That's absolutely right. And when you look at municipal elections, which don't even take place at the si same time as other elections, who are the people going door to door for candidates? Union members. Why do we need to revisit that? I know there's been talk about changing the city uh, elections so that it's a more yes. of a open S system. Yes, we've asked the legislature this year to realign them so that uh, people go out to vote the same time they vote for their president or their governor. What would that do? It would increase the number of people going to the polls in municipal elections so that the special interests that feed off the city are not the only people who turn out to vote. Mark, when you when you broke this story uh, through the Goldwater Institute, Mark's been an investigative reporter for, for years in this town. Um, what did you learn? When you were looking at all this, what, what were you kind of going home at night and going, wow, didn't know that? Uh, I get, the, the thing that astounded me is I, I've covered government my entire career, and I had always assumed that the unions were paying for the unions. Uh, the unions are very politically active. They have a lot of power, the, the, the firefighters union, the police unions, um, the teachers unions. You just assume, I guess, that, that it, you know, you wouldn't, th you wouldn't even think in your head that the taxpayers are paying for this. That was astounding. The other thing that was astounding is just sort of this bureaucratic inertia, this notion of, well, we're not going to stop and look at what we have, this notion rather that we're just going to take what we have and add to it. There's just really no critical thinking going into the, would, would, to these negotiations. Would we have ever been here in this discussion with Scott Walker in Wisconsin, uh, would we have ever had this discussion, had this economy not completely tanked, where, where the, the tide exposed, uh, the lowering tide exposed the problems? Probably not. We, uh, we now have members of the city council like Sal DeCicio who are uh, bulldogs and who are looking to save every penny and he's the guy who found this. As we move forward, do you believe in these negotiations with the city, and I'm talking about the city of Phoenix because it's happening right now, that with the exposing some of this stuff, that it will be impossible for the unions to get this stuff back in, that it'll have to come out. Well, I would never un underestimate what the unions can get out of the city, but but at least now it's on the table. People are know about it. People know to look at it. Uh, Greg Stanton, who uh, during the campaign was branded the union candidate, uh, he's put out a statement saying this is wrong. This should not be taking place. Unions need to be paying. Uh, union dues should be paying for this stuff. Uh, Several members of the city council have said, we need to eliminate this. So th there is a political will building at the council level not to allow this thing. And next time it comes around, if we find some other provision that gets uh, snuck in, 
the, the argument that staff didn't tell us will not wash. Goldwater has now gone from filing position papers to filing suit. We've yes. got about 15 seconds left. That's really the hammer that you guys have lacked. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. On behalf of the taxpayers, this practice is widespread. It affects the taxpayers. It takes firefighters and police officers off the streets, and it's unconstitutional. Guys, thank you both. Uh, Clint Bullock, my old friend Mark Flatten. Good to see you both uh, Good to on see Newsmakers. You.